You're watching Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV from Toronto, Ontario. I'm Catherine Bullock. Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. Today, a conversation with Nikita Valerio, who is research director at the Institute of Religious and Sociopolitical Studies about Muslim owned knowledge production. First, some headlines. Green Party leader Anami Paul resigns. Anami Paul renounced her decision to resign on Monday following her loss at the Toronto Centre riding where she placed fourth. Paul also failed to increase green seats in Parliament. Her resignation follows a leadership review in June where fellow party members accused Paul of racism and sexism influencing her leadership style. Disagreements with, between Paul and Green MP Jenica Atwin, also in June, over the Israeli-Palestinian conflict led Adwin to cross the floor to the Liberals. In the 2021 federal election, two Green MPs were elected, which is down from three in the last parliament. There was veteran and former leader Elizabeth May and Mike Maurice from Kitchener Centre. Medical exemptions are not accepted in a Toronto restaurant. A Toronto restaurant says it will only allow fully vaccinated people to enter in an effort to avoid fake medical exemption letters. Owner of the restaurant, Cindy Stern, says she will accommodate for those with medical exemptions if they come through the takeout window. Ontario residents are only given medical exemptions if they have an allergic reaction to an ingredient in the vaccine or if they have myocarditis or pericarditis after the first shot. Under Ontario's Human Rights Code, all restaurants must serve any disabled customers, says David Leposki, a lawyer with the AODA Alliance. 115 Canadians detained in China, four on death row. On Saturday, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spevol returned to Canada after spending three years in arbitrary detention in China. This follows the release of Min Wen Zhao from her house arrest in Canada. On Sunday, Global Affairs Canada announced that there are still 115 Canadians in Chinese prisons. This includes high profile Canadian Uyghur Hossein Jalil. Four of the imprisoned are on death row. The Office of Global Affairs says that Canada opposes the death penalty in all cases everywhere. Canada is pressuring China to give clemency for those facing the death penalty. Five Palestinians killed after town raids by Israeli soldiers. Ahmed Zaran, Mahmoud Hamdian and Zakaria Badwan were killed after Israeli soldiers raided their town Beit Anan in Jerusalem. A similar attack left two more dead in Burkina. Osama Sabo and 16-year-old Zufsa Sabo were killed by Israeli soldiers when they raided the town. The raids in Beit Anan and Burkina led to battles with guns, which resulted in the death of the five men. According to Israeli media, the army raids were carried out in order to apprehend Hamas operatives. They also say that two Israeli soldiers are hospitalized after being seriously injured during the violent battle. That's it for the news, and now an interview with Nikita Valerio, Research Director of the Institute of Religious and Socio-Political Studies. With us now is Nikita Valerio, who is Research Director with the Institute for Religious and Socio-Political Studies. We're going to be talking about Muslim ownership of knowledge production. Welcome to the show, Nikita. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you for joining us. I believe you're in Edmonton, right? Although it looks like you're at the Kaaba. <laughs> yeah, Treaty 6 territory here in Edmonton. Well, uh, many people might not have heard for the Institute for Religious and Socio-Political Studies. So before I ask you uh, some questions about the work that you've been doing, please just give us a very brief overview of the Institute. 
Mm -hmm. So IRSS, as it's also known, has been around for a few years. We've done a number of research fellowships already. Effectively, we are a actionable and policy-based institute that does uh, produces original research and develops original forums for discussion on topics around Muslims in Canada, uh, whether they're in the contemporary sociological light, historical. Uh, it's a very interdisciplinary-based academic institute. Um, and yeah, we've been working really hard and I'm looking forward to talking to you about some of the work that we're producing today. I remember that you mentioned that you've launched a new journal. So how about studying there? What's the journal? Why is it get important to launch a journal? Tell us about that. This is really an exciting development for us. Um, we launched the Religious and Sociopolitical Studies Journal, also known as RSSJ. We're a big fan of acronyms, apparently. Um, but it's an academic uh, double-blind peer-reviewed journal that is published out of the University of Alberta uh, Open Journal uh, Resource uh, website as well. And they publish a number of academic journals and they help you through the whole process there. So it's wonderful that we're able to produce this. And the initiative behind it was to create an academic peer reviewed space where articles um, pertaining to research around Muslims in Canada could really be amplified uh, in their publication um, and to create space for conversations around Muslims in Canada that aren't necessarily always happening. So around the topics um, that are important to ordinary Muslims and Muslim communities across the country. Um, so it's, it's wonderful because it is uh, an an academic space, but it's very um, Muslim oriented and Muslim produced. Could you expand a little for the people who are not in academic space, maybe to understand why having, um, um, I, I'm going to use the word control or ownership over a journal, like what, what is that? Aren't there already journals publishing about Muslims in Canada? So what, what, what's the uh, value added there? Um, there's a huge value added. First of all, you have to decide really when you're putting forward um, the topics that you want to cover or the themes that you want to cover in specific journal editions. You get to put what you want to have emphasis on. And I think all of us are aware of the fact um, that whether it's uh, the highest levels of academia or in media, um, the narrative about Muslims that's put forth um, can be outright harmful, um, even or it can be harmful implicitly so. And so having Muslim kind of ownership over the production of knowledge through an academic journal is crucial because it changes the stories that we can tell um, in a particularly uh, validated way through academics. Um, through a lot of, um, you know, the academy, of course, people are focusing a lot on things like Islamophobia, which are absolutely central to the Muslim experience here in Canada. However, that causes a lot of other things to be overlooked. Um, and also, you know, a lot of research that's out there is amplified because of how it's funded. Uh, and when you have an independent research institute um, that's choosing to focus on kind of what information is coming up from the ground of research, from the voices of Muslims across the country themselves, that paints a very different picture. It might overlap in many ways, um, but in other ways, it might provide a unique insight uh, that other, other journals and institutes can't necessarily do. So can you tell us a little bit about what those things from the ground are? What what are coming up? You used the word ordinary Muslim voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, across our research spectrum, we have like a number of, of uh, research projects that are on the go and ones that we have already completed. For example, um, in 2019 and 2020, we completed a national study on Canadian Muslim youth. We interviewed 72 mute youth from five different cities across the country, which is a quite a large sample size for a qualitative study. Um, and from there, uh, using, you know, effectively our methodology was to listen to what's happening on the ground, to ask open-ended um, research questions in our focus groups and in our interviews to hear what youth themselves had to say about the challenges that they're facing and about how they're cultivating resilience in the face of those challenges and what they think the solutions are uh, to the challenges that they face. So hearing 
hearing from folks from a very wide cross section, a very diverse sample set, and hearing the same things over and over again um, that may or may not be reflected in the academic literature itself, I think is a very powerful tool for creating actionable policy around specific issues. The youth one being one, of course, we're also doing a, ma uh, a major national study on the impact of Muslim organizations right now. Uh, we're doing a major national study replicating the youth study on Muslims in Canada. So it's more of an attitudinal things. What things matter to Muslims from you know various cross sections of society, socioeconomic differences, at, across ethnic differences, across gender differences, across different immigration status, uh, you name it. What are the common common themes in terms of concerns and issues and priorities for Muslims across Canada? And from there, you can deepen your research questions and do further studies, inshallah. So what were some of the common themes that the youth across those five cities were telling you? Um, the number one theme that came out was that they're facing a crisis of identity, unfortunately. Our Muslim youth um, are trying to navigate their way as Muslims in Canadian society. They have a number of constraining factors, um, whether it's in within their families, uh, generational differences and differences in understanding within their families. Um, feeling a lack of a sense of belonging um, within Canada or their local, uh, you know, non-Muslim communities and schools, um, or it's a lack of a sense of belonging within the Muslim community itself, just really lacking like a soft place to land, feeling the burdens and the stresses of things like code switching, uh, you know, moving between worlds and having to be on display and performing in different ways for other people. So uh, this causes a lot of stress and many of the outcomes for Muslim youth, unfortunately, Unfortunately, reported in the study were very dire um, things like mental health issues, um, you know, some suicidal ideation, um, some at risk behaviors, um, different things were reported in youth about themselves and about their peers that they're seeing happening because of this overarching issue in a climate of Islamophobia. Now, I helped the Environics do a national survey of Canadian Muslim opinion in 2016. I, I looked at the date. I can't believe that's already like five years ago. But one wow. of the things that we found was uh, you know, there were very high percentage, 83% had said they're proud to be Canadian. And 55% uh, said they had a strong belonging to Canada. But when that statistic was broken down into age, the youth only had 41%. Uh, I was quite struck by your research, which you reported only 1.5% of your interviewees felt a strong belonging to Canada. So I wonder if you feel like things have deteriorated since 2016 or it was just a different sample that was reached or how do you, how do you kind of, um, exp how would you sort of explain that or comprehend that? Mm -hmm. So there's a few different ways. A couple of things, of course, um, it's a small sample, right? So anytime that you're getting a smaller sample, you're going to be looking at statistics that are fairly general generalizable, but not always. Um, the other thing that I would say is that the criteria for belonging, so it's interesting that there was a disconnect for me with um, in speaking with Muslim youth, and I'm seeing it now in speaking with Muslims of all ages um, for our, our wider study across the country. Um, there's a disconnect between uh, being proud and, and being proud of what they believe Canada can and should be and feeling like they belong in that in that context. Um, and one of the things that really jumped out at me in the study with the youth was their differing understandings of what belonging meant. We actually asked them what their criteria for belonging was. Many of them felt it was, you know, having an open rhetoric of um, acceptance and inclusion and having that be forefront. Many, many other youth felt that if they're not, if they didn't feel like they were contributing within society, um, that they didn't belong in that society. So they needed a place where they actually felt like they were contributing, where their voice was being heard, where their actions and their volunteering was being heard. Um, so it's interesting to note um, that particular phenomenon. But the other thing to note, too, is that that includes not only Canada as a whole, but also within their particular community. So youth aren't necessarily finding themselves in their local community, and they're not necessarily finding themselves um, within their local Muslim community as well. So this overarching feeling of I don't really belong anywhere kind of continued to come out in that study, unfortunately. And that's why it's so important that we turned this into an actionable piece where we're recommending that Muslim organizations create those soft places to land for youth that they so desperately need. 
So we have to wrap it up. Uh, I, I, I would like to ask you if you could in just, I don't know, one minute, which is very unfair to you, but what is then that number one recommendation that you think comes out of this research, which is a very, uh, there's a very big uh, hill ahead for the Muslim community to try to help bring those numbers to more satisfactory levels. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I could sit here for an hour and talk about recommendations, particularly for youth themselves and for government, um, but I'll focus specifically on Muslim organizations. And it's really about um, prioritizing having youth voices at the decision making tables because youth know what they need. Listening to youth about what they need in, in their communities um, and, and giving them the space and the resources to be able to build the spaces of belonging and care that they require within Muslim communities will go a very, very long way um, to addressing many of the issues that they're talking about, whether it's the generational differences or the lack of actionable uh, actionability within their lives within their communities. Um, that small small shift in ethos alone uh, can make a huge difference in youth lives. Well, Nikita Valerio, Research Director for the Institute for Religious and Sociopolitical Studies, thank you very much for taking the time out to come on the show and talk to us about the Institute and the research. Uh, and we look forward to, to more great work from you in the future. Inshallah, barakallahu fikum. Thank you so much for having me. That's it from us, Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Stay tuned for another episode. Stay safe and God bless.